Hey, Edith. Hey, Christy. If you crossed a zucchini with our first president, what would you get? Um, a bloated Washington? <laughs> George Squashington. <laughs> oh, George Squashington. Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners from Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening has gotten very popular. And we've noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips. A fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Christy. Hello, Edith. And hello to gardeners everywhere, mm-hmm. including in the Netherlands. Oh, yes. Hello out there, ne- Netherlands. We have. For some reason, we charted in the Netherlands. So That's just very cool. We made the charts. That's very, very cool. We have a town here called Nederland, ne- ne- nether- which is, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Nederland. Nederland. We have a town here called Nederland. Where they have the dead guy, a frozen dead guy. So we're just making a connection that maybe need not have been made. The frozen dead guy festival. The frozen dead guy festival, exactly. So Are you Christy, going this year? No. <laughs> <laughs> I okay, never go. Okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> well, um, we should tell people about what's happening in our beautiful Denver metro area this oh. weekend. Folks, let's start off by saying that yesterday it was 88 degrees. I have a laundry line where I hang my laundry. I did four loads of laundry in two hours. They, by the time one washing was done, the one on the line was dry. Oh my goodness. Because of the hot, dry wind. We it had was yesterday. windy. So, what's the weather like today, Christy? Well, right now it is raining, which we do not mind. Mm-mm. But probably by the time we're done recording this podcast, it is going to turn into snow. Snow. Maybe in, five in to thing. six inches in the city, oh maybe two feet in the mountains, which I love it when it's in the mountains. And I don't mind it when it's down here, except that I put out so much of my garden. Everything is out. But now I've just covered everything. Yeah, I covered a lot of things too. Um, but and it's not the end of the world. Well, here's the thing, Christy. Remember I told you about tr- successfully transplanting, th- well, I transplanted three raspberry bushes and only one made it. Uh huh. And you kind of made a little joke about, oh, I'm going to have one raspberry. And I'm <laughs> right. like, okay, I'm going to buy some more. So I ordered some. Oh, no. From uh, Johnny's Johnny's Seeds. Yeah, in that's Maine. a great company. Yeah. And uh, they arrived today. They, uh. In fact, they say we're not going to send them until your zone is ready for them. So at least they're not in the ground, though. They're not in the ground. Um, I could, they're good for, they said, if I keep the, it's a bare root situation. If I keep the roots moist, I said moist. Shout out to moist. Uh Oh, I meant damp, but I said moist (laughs) because of you. You meant slightly wet. Slightly wet. If I keep them like that, Uh keep them between 32 and 39 degrees. So that keeps them dormant. Mm. They'll last for a week and I can plant them when it's warmer. Yeah, well, that's kind of what happened to me is that I had put everything onto the vegetable garden this week, mm-hmm. and I even told somebody they said, "Is it too? Is it too early? I should wait until after Memorial Day." And I go, "Oh no, I looked at the weather. It's going to be the lows are in the fifties for the next ten days. I go, you're fine. Go ahead yeah. and plant out. Yeah, and I bet you they're cursing me right now. Um, I had my tomatoes are out there. Wow. My cucumbers sprouted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not so worried about the cold season." Vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, lettuce. Cabbage, that's probably going to be fine. Although I covered them anyway because they're so teeny tiny. I covered it anyway. anyway. And yeah. I even covered like my my cucumbers that are coming up. I put a layer of mulch on them. Me too. I, I bought a, mulch yesterday, more mulch. Mm-hmm. I put a frost blanket on top of that. And then I put a container on top of that to trap some heat in. Wow. Because cucumbers do not like the cold. No, no, they do not. And the tomatoes, I think, will be okay. They just might get mad. But peppers can get super mad. And peppers can get so mad, they won't even give you fruit. You can just have a really nice plant all year long. Oh. And then it'll be September, and you're like, what the heck? Oh, man. So I'm hoping that things will things will be okay. Me too. When, I, when we're done with this and I get back home, I'm going to put a frost blanket over my lettuce. 
And I did. To keep it lifted a little, I'm going to put some, like, some of those bigger clay pots so that five inches of snow doesn't smush it to the oh, ground. Oh, that's a good idea. And then on top of the clay pots, I put a rock. I put a rock on every single thing because it was so windy last night. It's amazing, you guys, when you can feel. I think the temperature dropped 30 degrees in two hours, and you literally yeah. can feel the cold coming in on a really mm-hmm. wicked wind. We went to see Carmen last night at Opera Colorado. Yeah. And when we left, it was in the 80s. And when three and a half hours later, you know, when Carmen is dead on the on the ground. I love that opera. Um, it had dropped 30 degrees. Yeah. It got really cold. So that's uh, that keeps us busy, folks. Yeah. And, and it can happen, you know, and covering things. Just don't let plastic touch the plant. Mm-hmm. But you could use boxes. You can use, I used five-gallon buckets, mm-hmm. blankets, make a big giant blanket for it. We have a link on our on our up on our website. Mm-hmm. I'll post yeah. on our website with yeah. more details on that for other people because other parts of the country it still might not be the end of it. That's true. That's this has happened before, true. and we've gotten through it. Yeah, it's just annoying, and it's a lot of work too. It's just a lot of work. And yeah. I had to stop planting as soon as I saw the yeah. weather. I went, "Oop, I'm done." Yeah. So, Edith, I have thirty winter sowing jugs in Ugh. various stages of sprouting, just planted in my. Wow garage right now. Well, thanks to you, um, my all the cauliflower and all the cabbage that I planted came from winter sowing. So that that's just a delightful thing that I learned from you. I love that. Me too. My, my broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Saves us a couple bucks and you get the satisfaction of growing something from a seed, which yeah. is so nice. Absolutely. Well, besides the coming snow, Edith, how else is your garden going? Well, I guess it's fine, you know. It was doing just fine, you know, my hundreds of lettuce plants. I did a mistake last year. I really let the parsley take over. And now I find it's almost impossible to get rid of parsley. So you dug all of it up a couple weeks ago with yeah. your daughter, right? And now there must have been seeds in the in the soil <laughs> because here come the little ones. And even the little tiny ones sometimes have like a six-inch root. Yeah, they go deep. They are so hard to get rid of. But, you know, my onion circles are beautiful. Nice. They're they are they're like meditative, you know, like zen. And um, <laughs> finally, my Viraflé spinach is up. Oh, my the goodness. The giant spinach. I didn't yeah. think it was going to make it. I got four of them up. Isn't that weird how you, you can lose faith in something? Yeah. And then that happened to me last year when I tried to grow peppers from seed and I got so I thought they weren't going to happen and so then on top of the the did you direct sow jug, them into the ground I did a um milk jug and I thought well they're not coming up so instead I put cosmos seeds in the same jug uh, and then I realized I saw cosmos and peppers coming up together together yeah peppers didn't make it cosmos won well, the fight I did peppers in a uh, seedling in little pots and oh my gosh what a success they're still very tiny. Thank goodness I haven't put them out. Because like mm. you said, they don't like the cold at all. Um, can I tell you about my, remember my pepper experiment, Edith, where I was going to winter, overwinter peppers? I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. So friends, apparently this works where you can take, you can dig up peppers or if you have a pepper in a pot, either case, pot it up, put it in the attic, Water it just every now and then. Let it get dormant. The leaves are going to fall off. Don't let it freak you out. Mm-hmm. I did it with two pepper plants, and I want to show you what they look like. Mm, I'm looking at them. Yeah. the The question is, is well, they both look dead. They both look one dead. One looks less dead. I I wouldn't even call it like one looks more alive. It looks less dead than it the looks other. Le- it look, you know, the one looks like waiting for Godot's tree. <laughs> Yeah, it's it just like this stick. Yeah, it looks really bad. So I think this one, and this one is the bikin ho. Yeah. It looks dead. Uh-huh. So that didn't work. But this one, which is a tobango, it has green, like the stem here. It looks yeah. green, Edith, doesn't it? Yeah. So I might bit. keep watering it. And what when the sun comes lose? up. Keep watering it. Yeah, but I think I'm going to release this one into the compost pile mm. and let it mm-hmm. have a new life. Yeah, new life as something else. <laughs> as something else. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so far not working. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. We'll we'll hang on to the hope that the one will work. Anything else going on in your garden, Edith? Christy? I don't. Not really. But do you know that May is National Egg Month? That would be appropriate. 
isn't it? It's very appropriate. Easter should be in May too, come to think of it. But um, yeah, it's the perfect food. And who produces the eggs that we eat, Christy? Uh, um, chickens. Chicken. Ding, 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 ding. She's absolutely right. I'm getting excited, Edith. And what if you had a chicken that was really upset? What would you do? I had an upset chicken? Yeah. Um, I would maybe suggest a therapy. <laughs> To no, that, to that's deal, for a sad to deal with it. It's, oh, this is an angry sad chicken. Too. This is this is an upset, angry chicken. Yeah. Well, therapy still might be good. Maybe anger management. There you go. Or you could hypnotize it. So finally, you Edith, finally, are you going to share with us? Yes. Your long tease about how yes. to hypnotize a chicken. There's two ways, Christy. Uh -huh. One is the oscillating finger method. What you do is you place the chicken on its side with the wing under its body. Hold it down gently with one hand. Now, if you've ever tried to hold a chicken down, gently is really not going to cut it, but okay. I'm just reading what I read, okay? Uh -huh. You will want to make sure its head is flat on the table. <laughs> Again. The chicken's going to think you're going to chop its head off and it's going to get more upset. Yes, it does. But in the meantime, as you have this very upset chicken under your hand, you use a finger with your other free hand and you move it back and forth in the front of the bird's beak. Like we've seen oscillating, like we see. Like when somebody would hold a pocket watch and say, yes, the key is to go from the tip of its beak without actually touching the beak to a point that is about four inches from the beak. Uh -huh. Keeping the finger in a parallel line to the beak, repeat the motion until the bird is out. That's kind of cool. That is cool. We also have the sternum stroke method. Uh-huh. So you place the bird gently on its back, <laughs> which is different. Mm -hmm. You may have to use an item to keep the bird from rolling to its side. <laughs> so now we have an item and a bird. How about like a weighted blanket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Maybe they make little ones just for chickens. Oh, my God. You, uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course they do. Hammer Schlemmaker, someone like that, that makes totally <laughs> things that nobody really needs. Okay. So you hold the bird down with one hand. With your free hand, lightly massage the bird's sternum with your thumb and index finger slightly spread out. You look confused, Christy. I think you're asking me, <laughs> where's the sternum on a chicken? I looked it up at the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it said, the sternum consists of a plate lying ventral to the thoracic cavity and the median keel extending ventrally from it. Well, I would think a sternum on a chicken would be like where it roughly is on a human being. Exactly. And okay. this is, I mean, this is like a like a doctor wrote it that wanted to obfuscate what he did to you. Or like when you cut up a chicken, right? No offense, yes. but you can, so it's you're like cartilage, right? Yeah. You're massaging the sternum okay. until the chicken is out. So that's how you hypnotize a chicken. Well, you know, this is just one of the many things people learn on Upside Down Tulips. This is. So, you know, there are still people out there, I think, who um, who don't look at chickens as pets, who look at them as food when their egg-laying days are over. Perhaps they want to make a nice chicken soup. <laughs> and I, the reason that I was interested in this is one day my mother made me hold the chicken down so she could chop off its head. Oh. That is one irritated chicken. Yeah, you never forget that, do you? No. That, you know, I'm just not the kind of person that really wants to participate in slaughter. Yeah. But uh, if you're going to eat it, you got to be able to slaughter it. Yeah, there was that one headless chicken that like lived for like five years after that. Did yes, because he, he still had the malignia or something. He still yeah. had something back there. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. They do run around without a head for a few seconds. They do. Like they say, when you chop off a queen's head, her mouth keeps talking. That happens with a chicken too. <laughs> <laughs> well, just interesting facts that's all well folks if there are words or terms you don't understand don't forget to check out the humorous and informative upside down dictionary at our website at upside down tulips.com that's right and we also have fun stuff oh my gosh so woohoo facebook instagram pinterest and now in honor of our topic this week, which we're talking all about squash, and in honor of the fourth season of Stranger Things coming out this week, we have a brand new Stranger Garden Things pod play. But first, 
Let's repeat the first one, don't you think, Edith? I think, and these, these, by the way, are written by the Christy Montour Larson herself. <laughs> yes. Previously on Stranger Garden Things. Just wait right here by this compost pile, rhubarb. I'll be right back. Please don't leave me alone, Christy. Feels strange here. Ah! Rhubarb! Rhubarb! Barb! And now, Stranger Garden Things. Barb! Where are you? Thanks for helping me search for rhubarb, Edith. Where are we? Your garden is all upside down. Even though this garden contains the same locations and infrastructure of your garden, it is much darker, colder, and obscured by an omnipresent fog while ash-like spores drift through the air. It appears we have slipped down a portal into an alternate dimension. Ooh, check out how everything is overgrown with ropey root-like tendrils and biological membranes covering practically every surface. It all feels strange, Christy. I'm scared. Let's get out of here. But we have to find my rhubarb. I don't like that strange-looking compost pile. Oh, no. What is that strange thing sitting on top of it? Barb? No. Oh, it's just a spaghetti squash. The seeds must have germinated because the compost pile wasn't hot enough because you haven't turned it in a year. Wait, look over there. That thing is even stranger. With all this fog and ash-like spores, I can't tell. What is that stranger thing? It appears to be a very, very large zucchini. This is what happens when you don't harvest zucchini in time. Zucchini is best harvested when the fruit is about six inches long. If left unharvested, zucchini squash will easily oh reach... Oh my oh. gourd! It sees us! Run! Wait! What about me? Sorry, rhubarb. Normally we don't mind things upside down, but this is all just too strange. Look, <laughs> Need sugar. Here we are, talking squash and or gourds. Same thing, right? Same thing. Same thing. Uh, fun fact, Edith. Yes. Did you know the word squash comes from the Algonquin word? A scutuk squash. I did not know that. It means green thing eaten raw. Oh my God, eaten raw, huh? They must be talking about a zucchini. Oh yeah. Hey, did you know, Christy, that um in at the at the American Indian Museum in Washington DC, it's one of the best food, one of the best menus in in the city. The food is unbelievable and a lot of it is squash. Because, That's wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? Really they the deliciousness of it. Folks, squash is delicious and we're going to tell you why you should plant it and there's more fun facts. Well, there are two different kinds of squash. There's a summer squash and a winter squash. Mm -hmm. Right. Summer squash, like zucchini or patty pan squash. Mm -hmm. Or yellow squash. Uh huh. Summer squash, also called summer squash, uh -huh. have thin skins and can be eaten whole, skin, seeds, and all. Mm -hmm. Winter squash, like pumpkins or butternut squash, acorn, spaghetti squash, have robust skins that aren't usually edible. Christy, do you know that of all the winter squashes, that they're they're actually in like three categories? Hmm. I looked this up. This is so interesting. They're all cucurbita something. So, and it based on the hardness of the skin. Mm. The harder the skin, the longer they'll last through the winter. Mm. Uh, there's cucurbita maxima, there, which translates loosely from the Latin into very hard. There's Curcurbita moschata, which translates into semi-hard. And there's curcurbita pepo, which is soft. All winter squash. All winter squash. And so uh, depending on, the, like I said, the harder the skin, the longer it will last. Yesterday, Christy, 
I cut up the last of my curry squash. Uh huh. Because it was starting to get soggy, you know, and it. But it and was this still is squash you harvested last year. That I harvested last wow. October. This is May because it's a cucurbita maxima, very Perfect. hard skin. Nice. Mm-hmm. Well, even though most winter squashes are harvested in the fall, they're called winter squashes because they store well during long cold winters, and that's when most people cook and eat them too. I think. Don't I you think, think so too. I think so too. Uh, squash and melons are related. They are related to honeydew and watermelon. They're kind of from the same family, mm-hmm. which makes sense because they're on a vine. They grow these plants mm-hmm. grow on a vine and have a blossom that needs to be pollinated by bees. And um, butternut squashes and most orange squashes are loaded with vitamin A. A single cup provides more vitamin A than most people eat in a day. Wow! In fact, four hundred times your the daily value to be exact. Wow. Make your pee really bright. <laughs> <laughs> and and 90% of the vegetables are imported into the U.S. from Mexico. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. So why, why go to the grocery store when they are really one of the easiest plants to grow? They can grow up. They can grow on a fence. So they don't take up a lot of room. They don't. They're also, winter squash also are better eaten after they're cured. A lot of them, uh, a lot of the seed packets will say, you know, cut them, but leave them to cure for a while in the garden. Or if you have squirrels or pests like that, you can bring them in the house and just let them sit for a while. Um, And um, that means after curing means after you harvest them, they should be allowed to sit outdoors to dry and toughen the skins Mm -hmm. by exposing them in the sun for five to seven days, or just place them in a cool, dry, ventilated area. Exactly. Sometimes what I do is I put them in a bushel basket and I put it on the porch in the sun because of the squirrels. When I see the squirrels start eating them. Yeah. Oh my yeah, gosh. They love it. Especially the cantaloupe. Oh my gosh, they love that. Well, when should you start planting squash? Well, mine's out there shivering right now. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, zucchini, summer squash, winter squash, and pumpkins all grow best when the air temperature is around 65 degrees. So depending upon your zone and where you live, that's usually for most places in the United States, that's around late spring, just about anywhere. Uh, Most summer squash will require around 50 to 65 days to mature, and uh, winter squash will take longer, Mm -hmm. 60 to 100 days to mature. Mm -hmm. But if you live in zones 3 to 10, which is a lot of places around the world... Um, you can start growing them around late spring, which is essentially late May, early to mid-June, right? And and they're easy to start in little pots. They're also easy to direct sow. So they excellent. will come up. They absolutely so easy. will come up. They're so easy. As long as you have full sun, warm weather, yeah. and good air circulation yeah. to mature them. When you're planting squash yeah. seeds, yeah. about a half an inch to an inch deep. Okay. Okay. N- don't put them on the ground. They do need they do they need darkness to germinate. Don't they often say you should plant two or three in a little hill like? Yeah, make a little tiny hill. You know, I've done the hill before, Edith. Uh huh. And is it okay if the hill eventually just goes away from watering? Oh yeah, oh, goes away from watering. Yeah, like you know, if I'm watering watering it, the hill will kind of fade away throughout the oh, year. Oh, oh, that's fine. Oh, that's fine oh, okay. because they already have sprouted, right? Okay. I'm not sure what the whole hill thing is about. I don't to know. tell you the truth, but I always do it because everybody says it. to do it. Yeah, you make a little hill. Make you a little plant hill. two or three, and it's important to thin them. You don't want them to be crowded together because air circulation is very important. And remember what we've said previously, rather than pull, pull it out and interfere with everybody else's roots. So say you got three of them there, take a scissors and just cut it at the soil line. That's such a good reminder, Edith. Okay. That's good for thinning in general. It's good for thinning in general, folks. And, And now I'm all proud of myself for remembering to remind you. So proud. Um, there are some great things that plant well with squash. Tell us. Companion plants. A corn is a great. Yeah. I did that last year with curry and corn. Yeah, it was uh, great. It's part of the three sisters. Uh-huh. Corn, squash, and beans. beans that all work well. There's something about what the plants will release that the other plants want. Yes. In the growing process. In the soil. Yeah. It also kind of makes sense that the corn would shield the squash and the beans, or mm-hmm. the squash could grow up the corn. Maybe that's what it is. Mm. Um, also really good with onions, apparently. Nope. Lucky me, I have onions out there. Good. Well, that, that was a total accident. 
Um, and good with celery. Christy is starting to snow. Oh, it is. Yeah. Look at that. Look at those huge flakes. Okay, sorry, folks. It's it just, is we're sitting snow. in this basement. I look over there, and now it's snowing on May 20th. Is it May 20th? It is. Yeah. Okay. Okay, here comes the five to six inches. Here it comes. But we're going to be positive and look toward the future of our squash plants. Yes, we are. We are indeed. Yeah. Um, you should avoid growing squash with potatoes, I'm told. Okay, good. I just avoid growing potatoes now in general after the one, you know, mm -hmm. fitting on a teaspoon. That's yeah. not a potato. That's not even oh, a Did potato. I mention celery? It grows well with celery? No. Oh, okay. It grows well with celery. Okay. And I wanted to ask you, Edith, hmm? because I gave you a winter-sown jug mm. of celery. Celery. How is your celery doing? Nothing. Nothing. What? You said it has brought... I thought it had, <laughs> but I think it was just moss or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any celery. Okay, do you? well, I have a little bit. Oh. I've got a little grouping of a little bit of celery. And so I thought, well, I'm going to plant that with my butternut squash oh, this good. year. Oh, good. All so, right. Um, you should also be careful when you're planting squash not to plant two different varieties close to each other. Yeah, like right by close to each other. Like sometimes, you know, people don't have huge plots of land. True. But, but what do you mean by close to each other? Like within a couple of feet? Yeah. Don't do that. So like don't put butternut squash next to um, zucchini mm -hmm. or don't put summer squash next to spaghetti squash. Not right close next to. The reason being yeah. is that the bees will cross pollinate these plants and you will get a strange um, mutant oh. squash. Or or if it's, I used to let anything that volunteered showed up i used to let it grow uh -huh. but i stopped doing that because some of the inedible squash that would grow from seeds that were in the soil that had been cross-pollinated or something uh -huh. oh so in disgusting spongy like eating sponge yeah you know? i you know what i the squirrels won't even eat these weird gourds that's the bellwether right there. Yeah. If the squirrel <laughs> doesn't eat it <laughs> right i'm not going near it not well, letting it grow well like a lot of plants um, when it comes to watering and feeding squash, they require regular and even watering. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to keep the soil just moist. So you want to be careful of overwatering mm -hmm. and underwatering, but right. try to keep it just moist. And please avoid overhead watering. Right. Go right down to where the roots are. Go right on the bottom there. O we'll always water the... The toes and never the nose. Try not to get any water on the leaves because if you do, you will have a tendency to get some squash diseases. Yeah, like that white, uh, what is it called? A powdery mildew. A powdery mildew. Yeah, Ugh. or there could be a bacterial wilt, um, a blight. There are a couple little diseases that will play. But I tell squash. you, have you had a problem with that? I have not. I have. Oh, yes. Oh, you have? By the end of the summer, I tell you this, my zucchini leaves and my squash leaves will have a powdery mildew on it. However, does it affect the actual fruit of the plant? You know, I think what it does, though, is that because it has less leaves on it, there's less shade. You know oh. what I mean? The leaves will shade the fruit. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So um, you we recommend neem oil for that. Mm -hmm. Or you could also make your own antifungal agent, which is just back baking soda and water. If you dissolve one teaspoon of baking soda into one quart of water, you could also add a little Castile soap to help it cling to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I've learned, I started doing this last year, is start doing it before you see it. Mm. So as soon as like July happens, I start spraying. I do this with cucumber leaves too. I spray them and I had less of a problem last year than I have in the past. And now after discussing fungal anti-infectious things, I forget what you said, <laughs> fungal things, we'll go on to Stranger Things too. The world premiere of Stranger Things too. Previously on Stranger Garden Things. Looks like everything is back to normal in our small town of Wheat Ridge, Colorado. I even planted a bunch of butternut squash today. I don't know, Edith. Ever since my rhubarb got eaten by the demigourd in the upside down garden, I feel strange. Strange? How do you mean, Christy? Well, I can now garden with my mind. Watch. Oh my gourd! 
Your compost pile is being turned as if by magic. How are you doing that? I don't know, but every time I garden with my mind, my nose bleeds a little bit. See? Ew, gross. Hey, if it means my compost pile gets turned, I can live with it. Christy, do you think it has anything to do with the giant, high-security, top-secret lab with hundreds of employees on the edge of town? Good thinking, Edith. Let's hop on our bikes and find out. And now, Stranger Garden Things. I'm so tired of riding our bikes everywhere. Thanks for helping me find out why I now have psychokinetic gardening skills, Edith. What is this strange place? Mm. It may be your typical giant, high-security, top-secret lab with hundreds of employees on the edge of town, but this one has what looks like a giant and strange Georgia O'Keeffe painting at the end of the hall. It appears we have encountered another portal into the Upside Down, an alternate dimension of the multiverse. I'm scared, Christy. Let's get out of here. But I need to find out why I can garden with my mind. Look! It's a demigod coming through the scary symbolic iris. And another one. And another. And they look angry. Run! Oh my gourd. Squash need room and circulation, Edith. If planted too close, they get really, really mad. Stand back. I need to start looking like a young Drew Barrymore on the movie poster for Firestarter. What are you doing? You're scaring me. Ew. Your nose is bleeding real bad. You blew up the demigourds and closed the spooky vagina. You saved us, Christy. Let's head home on our bikes and see what I can do with Japanese beetles. Awesome. But first, you need a box of Kleenex, and I'm calling an Uber. It is still snowing outside. Big, huge, fat flakes. Mm-hmm. It's going to make me want a butternut squash soup. Oh, yeah, that would be good today. Wouldn't that be delicious? That's what I like to use with my butternut squash. And we're both growing butternut this year. I am. Because butternut, folks, is one of the easiest squash you can grow. There's no need to peel it because the skin is a little bit soft. You can have it, scoop out the seeds, chop it into chunks, roast it, salad it, soup it, whatever. And, you know, my sister-in-law was saying that she is afraid of cutting butternut squash. Why? Because it's such a scary, you like spaghetti squash, you know, cutting it, yeah, chopping it up. It's just a big, huge gourd. And so I told her, just cook it whole and cut it later. You can do that. Or, you know, what else you can do is cook it long enough to, to soften the skin. Uh-huh. And then and then you could take it out. And, of course, it'd be hot. So that's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of butternut squash are you growing this year? I don't know. Okay. Well, can I tell you about mine that I'm growing? Please. This I got... Uh- from my friend Tira, who lives in Southern California, and this is from a seed company called Row Seven, and this is variety eight nine eight. It's not a sexy name. Eight nine eight of butternut squash, and it's an experimental squash. What does that mean? Um, it means that it hasn't, I guess, been. Are you the first to grow it? I mean, what? Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a kind that they have up there that they're just exploring it and trying it out. Interesting. So they made a hybrid. Yeah, and here it is right here. I have it in my winter sown jug. Uh huh. I, I you probably planted this maybe a week ago, Edith. Oh my gosh, <laughs> only a week ago, and it's that yeah. big. I love this how they have on the seed packet. They say, cut in half lengthwise, remove seeds, face up on sheet tray, brush with oil, season with salt, cover with foil, four hundred degrees until soft. Save the maple syrup for pancakes. Hmm. It must be a sweet one. Because they're saying that this has been mm-hmm. bred to be very sweet, very concentrated flavor, sweetness, and beta carotene into a storable single serving squash. Very nice. I haven't grown butternut squash in a while. I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it too. I cannot wait. That's a, that's really cool. 
Mine is just simple old fashioned butternut squash. Okay, great. I do have red curry squash, which I've been growing for a couple of years now, and I really highly recommend it. It's from Japan. It's also called orange Hokkaido or Uchiki curry. Mm. Mm. And um, it's pretty. It's it's a teardrop shape. It's this beautiful orange. Hangs. It hangs on the the fence like lanterns. Oh, nice. You know what I? It's just it's beautiful. It's delicious. Um, it's not gigantic. Here's the thing. I had some small ones and some large uh-huh. ones. So it, the weight range is three to seven pounds. Oh, wow. That's pretty nice. And, and if I'm right, Edith, you offered your curry squash yep. seeds to the members of our garden party. And one of them, Pamela, I sent her some. And for the first time in her life, she direct sewed something. Uh-huh. Oh, and nice. then she emailed me two days later and went, they're not up yet. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, patience, pilgrim. Yes, right. It should be up in like seven to ten days, and sure enough, it was. Well, if you want to try some, if if people want to join the garden party, do you think you have more? Oh yes, squash seeds? yes, I do. Yes, oh, I do. good. So that's a benefit of if you join at a certain level, you get seeds from our gardens, friends. Just go to our website or check on the links in the show notes. And a red curry is it's a sweet and a little bit nutty. It's, uh-huh. it's delicious. You can make soup out of it or just roast it. With hot, with hot spices or mm-hmm. sweet spices. It's delicious. Well, for me, it's just not summer without zucchini. Of course. And it, even if it's the end of the summer and I have so much, I'm putting it in people's mailboxes or in their unlocked cars. Mm-hmm. And last year was so sad for me because I thought I was growing zucchini from seed and it just ended up being summer squash, which was good and I enjoyed it. But... I wanted zucchini too, and folks, she went me. to therapy over this. Yeah, I had she to, really. Did. I bought zucchini in the grocery store. That's Edith. unheard of. Can you believe that? No, I can't. And when I first started growing zucchini, I didn't know how little it was supposed to be when you harvest it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then you go to the grocery store, and it's it's like you know six inches. Uh huh. I remember one time, Edith, that you came over, and I says, "Hey, do you want some zucchini?" She goes, "Well, I just want it really little." And well, okay, which ones do you want? And you pointed to one that I swear to God, Edith, was two inches long. Well, then, that was the size of zucchini you wanted, yeah. and I went, "Okay." Um, but the kind I usually grow is from our favorite seed company mm-hmm. in the world, Botanical Interests, which we had a nice interview with Judy Seaborn mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. And this one is called Black Beauty I've grown them. That's a really good zucchini. And what I like about this variety is that, you know how zucchini can get really long and take over parts of your garden? Mm -hmm. This is very bushy. It kind of stays all in in one one area for the scheme scheme of zucchini. And so here I have planted some in a milk jug, Mm -hmm. winter sowing method. Very nice. I planted about a week ago, and it's already getting its second set of leaves. As a reminder, if you still have squash or actually anything in seed pots or in winter sowing jugs, wait until they have four leaves, their second set of leaves, before putting it into the ground. I always like how, Edith, you say this first set of leaves are like baby teeth. Like baby teeth. You don't want to stick a baby in the ground. Yeah. And I and your zucchini is in the ground. Mine is in here. And I'm not, I yeah. can't put it out until, yeah. Yeah. until the lows get Back into the 40s, upper 40s. Yeah, you're going to have to wait for days. Yeah. Yeah, and I have four of them here. Mm. And um, how many plants does an average household need of zucchini? A half. They need a half of a plant. A half a plant. (laughs) So I don't know. I have to find some friends to take these extra ones. If they are indeed zucchini, I'm thinking they are. I'm feeling good about it. I'm feeling good about it too. It's a reputable seed company. I Yeah, unless I got the wrong, you know, like if seeds spilled out and I don't know, I guess we'll find out what happens. What other squash do you like, Edith? I'm going to talk about the squash that I just, I love almost all squash. I love acorn, but I want to talk about some squash that I've never grown because I didn't know existed that I found when I was doing research. Pumpkin, by the way, is also called a squash. Yes, right. I don't, I, and Edith, I have winter sowing pumpkin. Just a quick side note, because oh, last year, if you remember, I got volunteer pumpkin yep. in my compost pile, which gave me, I didn't realize what joy that was going to give me. And I carved <laughs> it for Halloween, and I saved yeah. seed from it. Nice. So we'll see what happens. Well, here is something called a fairy tale pumpkin. It says, like other varieties of cheese pumpkin, they call it cheese pumpkin because you can cut it like a wheel of cheese. It looks oh, like a wheel of cheese. Yes. This one weighs up to 15 pounds. It has soft orange with swirls of brown on it. Oh, pretty. It's uniquely curvaceous. It's like a, <laughs> like like me. You are uniquely <laughs> curvaceous. I was going to say like Rodin's women, but okay, you too. You are a Rodin's woman. 
Um, and it has deeply ridged curves. It says, imagine a bunt cake in squash form. <laughs> I thought you would like I that because you're a that. baker. Yes. You know? So anyway, it sounds like it's delicious. Well, and you bring up a really good point. Not only squash delicious, but I also grow things because of what they look like. Yes. And and squash and gourds can have so many unique colors and textures. And Listen to this one, Christy. A North Georgia candy roaster. I've never even heard of it. But it is, um, the length, the length is about 20 inches long. Ooh. The skin is a gorgeous shade of sunset pink, and it has a gray-blue tip. Oh, wow. It sounds absolutely beautiful. And like the name says, it's as candy-ish, as sweet as squash can get. That's a North Georgia candy roaster. Oh, wow. Then I read about one called a Marina D. Chio, Chiogia. I don't know. I don't speak Italian, but that's what it looks like. Chiogia. Uh, Chiogia. That's right. Get the hand going. Oh, that's right. And my shoulders <laughs> went right up. 25 pounds. A 25-pound squash. That's a lot of soup. That you can serve like, that you can put on the grill and people eat it like steak. I guess it's big in, in Venice. Mm. Doesn't that sound delicious yeah. to char it? And finally... Coming from my old stomping grounds of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, there's the long neck squash, which is so beautiful. It's like it says, it has this long, 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 long neck. And at the bottom is a bulb of squash. Does it have a little hook? Yes. Yeah. But I mean, it's long. It's really, really big. And uh, it's called a, a Dutch crook neck, Pennsylvania Dutch crook neck or long neck squash. It's known for its easy preparation and slicing ability. And it is very famous in that area of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Oh, wonderful. That's what I got. Um, We already talked a little bit about how to harvest zucchini and how yeah. to harvest summer squash. Yeah. It's important to harvest it on when it's tiny. Yes. I once had a zucchini that I think got to be about four feet tall because <laughs> they hide. <laughs> You th when you say tall, I see it standing up. Yeah, I do. Which yeah. It doesn't They're actually long. stand up. Four folks. feet long. <laughs> yes. Right? But winter squash are very different. Yeah. You have to wait until the stem looks like it died. Right? Yeah. And if you tap on it, it should be like hollow kind of. Yeah. And check the back of your seed packet because it will not be ready early. And you need to harvest before the fr first frost, right? Yes. Christy, we have to we have to mention spaghetti squash. Yeah, because if you're a person that doesn't like to eat carbs, you want to grow spaghetti squash. Wait, wait, let's be honest. What? Who doesn't like to eat carbs? Okay, let me change that. <laughs> Who has decided not to eat yeah. carbs? They're my personal favorite. But spaghetti squash are, takes the place of the pasta spaghetti, and yeah. you, it's stringy. Makes it sound awful. It's not awful. It's delicious. So you might want to grow spaghetti squash. I accidentally. Grew a lot of spaghetti squash in my compost pile. That's where usually where it shows up. Right. <laughs> which is, which is delightful. Which is spaghetti squash. Yeah, it's That's delightful. why I'm, I'm excited for butternut this year. Yeah. Are you growing spaghetti squash? Always. Always, always, always. Okay, well, I, I will take a couple. Okay. All right. Because usually I get like 12 to sometimes 20 on one plant. So I always have extras. I always give a lot of them away. Well, uh, here's to everybody growing some squash. Soon as the snow melts, wherever you are, uh -huh. temperatures are at 65 degrees during the day, throw some seeds in the ground, zucchini, spaghetti squash, acorn. You'll have something to eat all winter long. Pumpkins. All winter long. Doesn't get any more expensive. It's just a couple pennies per seed. And now we've wrapped up the squash area of the podcast. <laughs> in other words, Edith, we squashed it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Excellent. I'm sorry. No, that's good. Sorry. That's good. That was so because I was like incoherent. So that's good. You kind of wrapped it up. Hey, Christy. Hey, Edith. TikTok. What time is it? What time is it? I think it's mailbag time. Ring, ring. TikTok. <laughs> Our letter today comes from Apurva. Hi, Edith and Christy. Shout out to saying my name first. Thank you so much. You must be a listener. I want to plant marigolds in time for my 4th of July wedding as they are used in traditional Indian weddings, and I love them. 
I winter sowed some hey, and I'm wondering, one, how early can I plant them directly outside? I hope they will be blooming by the wedding. Two, do you think they will be big enough? And three, are there any other beautiful red, orange, or yellow marigold-like flowers that will grow in time? I already winter sowed zinnias, too. Thank you in advance. Apoorva. I love that. I love marigolds. I do, too. We both have marigolds. My mom always had them. Well, they're easy and beautiful and cheerful. Yes. Mine are up. They sow, sow themselves, of course, now because I've always had them. But they're up like uh, about an inch high, some of them. And some of them yeah. are just come. They'll keep coming up. Me, too. And I've winter sowed some also. Um, and I love the idea of using marigolds at a wedding. Oh, me too. Yeah. Uh, it just sounds really beautiful. And, you know, marigolds are pretty frost sensitive. Um, I usually wait until early May to plant them in the ground. Mm -hmm. So right now we're into the end of May. Um, I winter sowed a bunch. Um, and I hope I hope she, if she has some in the ground, I hope she doesn't need to cover them because she's from Denver, right? Yeah, but I don't think so. I think they're really hard. They should be okay. And 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 if you if you can if you still have, if you have some seeds I'd throw them as soon as the snow and cold stops I'd throw them out into the ground as well. Yeah, um, the quickest growing marigold that I know is the French marigold. Mm -hmm. That's the smaller one that'll be kind of multicolored. Um, I of course love growing the African marigolds, and I gave those seeds away to members of our garden party. Mm -hmm. They're These taller. About They're three taller. feet mm -hmm. tall, and they had their the blooms are like pom poms, they're like the size of baseballs, and those are really beautiful, big, big stunners. Um, and you know, you can also go to your local nursery and buy plants mm -hmm. um, as a backup plant. So she has a lot. Her wedding is um, in early July, so I don't know if, if my marigolds are blooming by early July. Are I yours? Don't, I don't know. I, I can't. I don't think mine are. So mm -hmm. I would suggest going to a Go to your local nursery and um, have some marigolds as a backup. But a couple tips on marigolds is just to make sure you water, like a lot of things, water mm -hmm. regularly mm -hmm. but not too frequently. You should let the soil dry out for marigolds between watering. Um, but if it gets really hot, you may want to increase it. Uh, don't water overhead. Water the toes, toes not the and nose. not the nose. Um, if you get too much water on the leaves, you could get a powdery mildew buildup on it. Um, and deadhead as needed. And deadheading, friends, is removing the spent flowers. Um, they they actually do need a lot of deadheading, so you'll promote more blooms. The mm -hmm. more that you deadhead, uh, remove any dead or dying blossoms. And you can also pinch back the plants, too, if you want them to be a little bushier and don't want them to get leggy. And don't forget to fertilize and, when in doubt, mulch it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That will prevent weeds from growing and keep the soil nice and moist. I hope you have a beautiful wedding. Well, you will. I know you will. Thank I hope you. we get pictures. Hey, yeah. get pi Send us pictures. Oh, and you know, um, Apoorva is a member of the garden party. Oh, then maybe she really will send us pictures. Yes, she will. <laughs> she will so. And listen, I've got about a gallon of seeds. You want seeds? Let us know. Yeah, they are. They sure. Marigolds are so generous with their seeds, aren't, aren't they? they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, friends, if you have questions about what type of flowers you can grow or you want to talk about squash or you want to talk about what stranger garden things are happening with you, we hope you write to us. Upside Down Tulips at Gmail or at our website, UpsideDownTulips.com. There you go. Christy is looking both profound and pensive, and she's wearing sandals. That must mean... <laughs> That she has the inspiration of the week. <laughs> in honor of our charting in the Netherlands, I have a quote from Midas Deckers, who is a Dutch biologist and writer. Hmm. He says, It's a sign of wisdom that seeds don't squander their energy all at once. Instead, calmly waiting until the time is right. Seeds aren't stupid. Oh, oh, I love that. Little inspiration as the snow starts to pile up outside. Very nice. Seeds will wait and they're not stupid. And you know what? Since my marigold plants are up, the minute something comes up by itself, I know it's time if I want to plant it as well. Oh, that's a great tip. You know, thank you for that, Christy. That's 
that's a very nice inspiration. And thank you, everybody out there. Here's a general thanks for listening. We are Edith Weiss <laughs> and Christy Montour Larson. And if you got some laughs and some value out of this week's episode, could you please do us a favor? You could hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you listen to your podcast. It really makes a difference for us, and we appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. You think that one is good? You should you should hear her other stuff. Go to denisegentilini.com, or you can find that link at UpsideDownTulips.com and listen to her wonderful creative music. Many thanks to the kindness of our talented friend, Karen Slack as Barb. Thank you to our excellent yet enigmatic engineer. And a special thanks to our local nursery and friend of the show, Southwest Gardens. Thanks, Carrie. Join us in two weeks for another episode that will delight and amaze you. And don't forget, if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down to lips.